Hello, everyone, and welcome to this lesson where we're going to talk about high leverage practices in blended language teaching. I'm Fernando Rubio from the University of Utah. Let me give you a quick um, overview of what we're going to talk about in this lesson. So I'm going to talk about briefly about affordances, the, the notion of affordances, particularly as it applies to blended learning and then um, high leverage practices. And um, I will briefly talk about two high leverage practices in blended language teaching and learning. So let me start with the notion of affordances. Uh, some of you may be familiar with the, with the idea. An affordance is a relationship between the properties of an object and the capabilities of the agent that determine how the object could possibly be used. So that basically means an affordance is the relationships, the, the, the characteristics of an object or, or an environment that in a way um, limit or facilitate our behavior with that environment or that object. I'll give you an example, a practical example that will probably help you understand what I mean. Imagine that I gave you a chair and a baseball and I asked you to, to sit down. I'm assuming that you're a lot more likely to sit on the chair than on the baseball. Um, and why is that? Because the chair has certain characteristics that make the action of sitting on it um, natural. It has a certain size, a certain shape, um, certain characteristics that make it ideal for sitting on it. On the other hand, if I ask you to throw something, of course you could throw the chair, but I, I'm assuming you're more likely to throw the baseball because the baseball has a, a certain shape and texture that make it, make it ideal for throwing. Um, uh, it, it fits in your hand. It has a shape that makes it travel through, through the air quickly. It has a certain weight that make it ideal for throwing. So these are affordances of the objects that, as I was describing, limit or facilitate certain behaviors um, for us as agents. And that translates to teaching as well. So when you think about teaching in the, in the physical classroom, you have to think about some affordances of the physical classroom that make certain behaviors ideal and some limitations as well, some affordances of the physical classroom that, that result in limitations in terms of how we can teach. When we're thinking about a blended course that combines face-to-face -face and online, then what we have to do is think about the affordances of the two media the face-to-face -face context and the online context, and how we can take advantage of those affordances to, to do the best that we can um, um, when we teach. So think about the limitations of each of the two media and think about the possibilities that, are, that one medium opens versus the other. So when we, uh, when we, when we create, when we develop uh, blended courses, we have to keep that um, notion of affordances in mind. At my institution, when, when I have developed or redesigned uh, blended courses, I've uh, created a framework that facilitates the, the development process. So, and this is what I'm showing you right now. So uh, we, we use a framework that uh, consists of four phases, starting at the top with the design phase, and then the build, the teach, and the revise phase. And in each phase, we focus on certain things. So when we think about developing a course, then we start with an analysis of the, uh, the characteristics of the students, the needs of the students that are gonna be in this course, um, how the course fits in within a program, what are going to be the objectives of the course and how they fit within the objectives of the program, the specific outcomes of the course, etc. That's the first phase. Then we move to the build phase where we, based on the objectives and the outcomes of the course and the needs of the students, we build the activities that will allow the students to reach those outcomes. We uh, create the curriculum and of course, in a blended course, we think about the technologies that will allow us to uh, develop activities that will be effective in reaching those outcomes. Once that work is, is complete, then you move to the teach phase, which is where you're actually teaching the course, delivering the course. And this is where we um, focus on 
practices that are particularly effective in a blended course. And that's the, the portion of the design framework that I'm gonna talk about today, the, the notion of high lever, leverage practices. And of course, the final phase is the revision phase where you gather the, the evidence, the, uh, the feedback from the students, the evidence that you gathered of student learning, uh, the evaluation, and with that information, you go back to the beginning and, and make um, adjustments and, and, and redesign if necessary. <laughs> So when you think about blended course um, design, um, in, in the teaching of the course, we focus on, again, on those uh, high leverage practices. And when, when you think about high leverage practices, you think about things that are crucial, um, effective in, in a course that includes a significant uh, technological component. And I wanted to uh, pause there and think about the crucial in ingredients in courses that are enhanced with technology. Some of you may be familiar with the um, Online Learning Consortium, OLC. And OLC um, has come up with a, a scorecard that they use to um, assess the effectiveness of blended uh, programs. And if you look at it, I have highlighted some of the words that I'm particularly interested in. Um, they identify the criteria that are used to measure the effectiveness of the course. And as you can see, interaction is one uh, crucial piece of it. Feedback is another one. And presence is another one. And what I, what I want to talk about today, of course, all of you teach languages and understand the importance of interaction and the importance of feedback. Um, I'm going to talk about those things. And I'm also going to talk about the notion of presence, which um, is, is, a, is a crucial um, practice in, in um, online and blended courses, <coughs> teaching presence. So moving on to the notion of high leverage practices, uh, and this is what I want to focus on today. High leverage practice is a practice that when it is effectively implemented by a teacher that has been trained on how to use a practice, that practice is likely to facilitate student learning. High leverage practice is not just any practice that's based on anecdotal evidence. High leverage practice is also always backed by what we know about language learning and language teaching. So it has a research based base and um, in order for the practice to be useful we want to be able to um, decompose it into or deconstruct it i'm sorry into uh, its um, its critical components so that when we uh, talk about a high leverage practice we can say to a new teacher this is what this practice is made up of. These are the components of this practice. I can teach you how to use this practice. And these components are observable and measurable. So in my uh, work with uh, blended language courses, um, and particularly with in, in my recent work with my colleague, uh, Daria Mitza, we have come up with um, a, a preliminary proposal of four uh, practices that we think are core to the effectiveness of uh, blended language courses for HLPs, high leverage practices. And I'm showing them um, to you right now on this screen. Um, maintaining an effective blend, fostering autonomous learning, and practices three and four, which are the ones that I'm going to be focusing on today, enhancing teaching presence, and creating opportunities for interaction and negotiation. And remember, as I said earlier, that in order to make these practices useful and applicable, we have to be able to divide them into their uh, critical components. And sometimes each of those components subdivide them into micro practices that can be taught and observed and assessed. So let me start with um, HLP number three, enhancing teaching presence. The idea of teaching presence, as I said earlier, is crucial in, in um, online and technology enhanced teaching. Um, and this is the definition of teaching presence that has been used in, in research over the past almost 20 years. Teaching presence is the design, 
facilitation and direction of cognitive and social processes for the purpose of realizing personally meaningful and educationally worthwhile learning outcomes. So it basically refers to those three things, design, facilitation, and direction of learning. And teaching presence is crucial in, in courses that include technology because we don't want our students to be um, working in isolation. We want to make sure that they see our presence in everything that happens in the course. In a blended course, they will see us physically in the classroom, but we want to make sure that they see our presence in the online component of the course as well. So we think that maintaining and enhancing teaching presence in a blended course is a crucial practice. So again, let me go back. Designing, facilitating, and directing learning. And these are the three basic components of this teaching practice. If you want to be sure that your students see your presence in the course, you want to be able to design, facilitate, and direct their learning. And those three um, pieces of the teaching presence, the design and organization of the course, the facilitation of, of student, pro student progress, and the direction of instruction are easily seen in the uh, framework that I showed you earlier, right? So if you think about the design and facilitation, those are the things that happen in the first two phases of this framework, the design and the build phase. And then if you think about the uh, facilitation and direction, that's what happens when you're teaching and revising. So the three components of that practice are present in the, um, in the blended language learning framework that we, that we developed. <coughs> So going back to the teaching presence, as I said, in this high leverage practice, there are three components. One has to do with communicating clear and attainable outcomes by creating a well-planned path, learning path. The second one has to do with facilitating the progression through that path. And the third one with providing direction and explicit instruction when necessary. So how does that work in practice? Let's start with the first uh, component of that practice, the organization of the course. And I'll give you an example of how that may work. So we, again, we want to make sure that our um, footprint is clear in the organization of a blended course. And we do that by planning the, the learning path very well, very carefully and very intentionally. What we do is when we um, design a series of learning activities, we want to make sure that those activities move the student from a comprehension phase to a production phase, and that those activities always follow a progression from more controlled to more open-ended. So to give you an example of how that may work in practice, imagine that you are in your course, you're exposing your students to, say, the use of a particular function or, or grammatical feature like for example the use of commands right which may happen in an introductory course so we would start by making sure that we activate the student's background knowledge this typically in our case happens in the online component of the course and that's why um, in parenthesis it says virtual there in the virtual um, uh, portion of the course, we try to activate their background knowledge by giving them a couple of activities to make sure that they uh, remember what a command is, even in their target language and what it's used for, and that there are certain uh, grammatical forms that are associated with that function. Then, still in the online component of the course, we start by giving the students practice uh, with um, comprehension of this particular form or function. Right, so practice that uh, requires the students to work with the form, but not necessarily produce it yet. So they go through a phase where they, they're doing comprehension activities, practicing this new form. And then we slowly move to a, a series of activities where they have the opportunity to start producing the new form or the new function, but in a controlled and guided um, fashion with a lot of, um, um, uh, participation from the from the teacher in the sense that we give them the direction that, that they need to follow. And we, we do this both in the 
virtual uh, portion of the course online and in the face-to-face -face, uh, portion of the course slowly giving them opportunities to produce the new forms and the new functions but in, in control environments and progressively we eliminate that scaffolding until we get to the point where they have to produce the, the new forms and the new functions in open-ended uh, communicative practice right and that again happens both uh, in the online component and the face-to-face -face component so we build a well-planned intentional path that moves students through the learning path giving them a lot of support initially and then slowly reducing eliminated that that scaffolding so that's one component of that teaching presence. That's a, a critical part of, uh, of our footprint that needs to be visible in the course. The second component is the facilitation. As the students move through that um, uh, path, that learning path, that, that progression in the learning path, our job as instructors is to monitor and guide and gather the evidence of their learning. Online, that's relatively easy to do because everything that the students do gets captured online and, and, and it gets archived. So we have evidence of their progress and it's easier for us to monitor their progress and gather that evidence and collect that evidence. But we also emphasize to our teachers in the, in the blended courses that the same practice needs to be present in the face-to-face -face course as well. So when the students are practicing and, and producing the new forms and the new language, that the teacher needs to be there actively monitoring and, and uh, physically sometimes taking notes or at least mentally taking notes of student progress so that they can use that um, evidence, that teachers can use that evidence uh, to facilitate <coughs> the student learning. And that second piece of the, of the teaching presence happens um, at the same time synchronously with the, with the direction of instruction, the third piece that I'm uh, showing you here. The direction of instruction happens where we inject ourselves, where we inject uh, with the teacher provides his or her expertise to facilitate um, learning when needed. So we use the feedback, the, the information that we've gathered in the previous phase where we're facilitating to inject ourselves when, whenever necessary or to facilitate other students injecting themselves and providing um, support and guidance in that teaching process. How does that happen online? Well, I'll give you a, a very practical example. When our students do activities online during the virtual um, component of the course. They're working on their computer on the right side, right half of their, of their monitor, they have the activity. On the left side of the monitor, they have access to uh, grammatical explanations that they may need to um, access when they're having difficulty with a particular activity. So there's always support there if they need it. Uh, when they're working online. Of course, when, that, when the work is done in the classroom, the teacher is there to provide that support when needed, to inject himself or herself into the process when needed. But even online, we make sure that they have access to that direction if it's, if it's needed. And we also emphasize the, the, the role of the student himself or herself and their peers as players in this, um, in this component of the HLP and in, in, in directing learning. So we make sure to train students how to use um, rubrics so that they can evaluate their own uh, production and they can help their peers with their production as well. So we give them rubrics every time there's a, 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 an activity where they have to produce the language, we give them rubrics that they need to understand before they um, uh, participate in the activity and that they can use to then if it's a, an online activity where they can go back and see their production they can use the rubric to go back and evaluate their production and do so with their uh, peers as well and we do that both um, virtually and online so that's a, a, a quick summary of how this uh, high leverage practice of enhancing teaching presence works for us in, um, in a blended course. 
And the next uh, practice that I wanted to also briefly talk about is the uh, practice that has to do with creating opportunities for interaction and negotiation of meaning. As you know, this is crucial in any language course and in technology enhanced language courses, some people claim that you know, uh, the opportunity to interact is somewhat limited. Um, we don't think that uh, that is the case. In fact, we think that if we are able to take advantage of the affordances of the two media, then we will be able to maximize opportunities for interaction and negotiation of meaning. So that's why we decided to select this as one of the HLPs for blended learning. And we break it down into these three components. In order to maximize those opportunities, we want to make sure that we use tasks that require exchange of unknown information, so um, real communicative tasks, and that we emphasize meaning and fluency in interactions in the classroom face-to-face -face, and that we focus on meaning and form in interactions that happen online. Let me explain what I, what I mean. So three components, real world tasks, uh, real communicative tasks. This is crucial when you, um, in order for a, a, um, an interactive task to be effective, it has to require real exchange of information. It has to have non-linguistic outcomes. So the outcome of the task cannot be, we're going to practice this particular grammatical form or vocabulary. You have to have non-linguistic outcomes. It has to require extended discourse. It cannot be that I complete the activity by responding with one or two words, right? And here you have examples of some um, types of activities that um, meet those requirements, uh, like information gaps, for example, or, or, or decision-making activities. What we do to take advantage of the affordances of the two media, as I said earlier, is we focus on fluency and meaning when we are face-to-face -face in the classroom, and we focus on form and meaning online. If you think about it, um, if we want to uh, foster the development of proficiency in our students, proficiency comes down to three things. It's accuracy, complexity, and fluency. And we can take advantage of the affordances of the two media to focus on some of those things in, in, in one component of the course and other things in another component. So we believe that in the face-to-face -face classroom, it's easier to focus on fluency because of the nature of communication, um, uh, in face-to-face -face communication. It's easier to um, give students the opportunity to communicate in the classroom and facilitate uh, the development of fluency because if we were going to pay too much attention to form, we would uh, risk breaking the flow of communication, interrupting communication. And that's why we prefer to focus on fluency. And when we uh, provide feedback to students, we uh, prefer to use recasts that are the least um, intrusive form of uh, feedback, if you want. So in our classroom activities, when we do um, interaction, we focus on fluency, we don't pay too much attention to form, or at least not uh, enough to make it intrusive. Fluency and meaning. And then when we do activities um, online, because of the nature of online interactions that, as I said earlier, get captured, uh, archived online, it's easier to pay attention to form. I can, I can have my students participate in a conversation online. That conversation gets recorded, archived. I can go back, listen to the conversation, focus on specific aspects of the conversation with, where students were struggling with form, and then point it out to them and give them explicit feedback. So by including a combination of activities that um, happen online and activities that happen on uh, face to face we can make sure that we pay attention to all three components of, uh, of proficiency uh, accuracy complexity and fluency um, that's a, a, a quick um, summary of two of the um, high levels practices that we are proposing uh, we have a, a forthcoming book that will be out at the end of the year Daria Mitz and Fernando Rubio, you have the title there. It's work in progress. And I want to emphasize this because what you guys do um, when you teach your blended courses um, should help everyone understand 
what high leverage practices are and, and, and which practices work effectively. So I encourage everyone to um, think about your practice in the, in the blended course, think about the things that work well, um, try to understand why they work well, try to uh, break them down into components of those practices that explain how the practice is um, implemented and, uh, and share those practices with the profession so that we can come to a better understanding of what works well in, in blended learning. There have been uh, efforts to um, come up with high leverage practices uh, for language teaching in general, um, but nothing in particular for blended language teaching. So it's work in progress and your participation in this, um, in this process, in this effort would be very much appreciated. So that's all for me. Um, thank you very much and uh, good luck in, uh, in your progress through this lesson. Thank you.